Hello, everyone. Dr. Yonit Arthur here. You are on The Steady Coach, and I am so excited today to bring you this fantastic interview with Mary Claire Dasagenis. Mary Claire is a clinical social worker, a psychotherapist, an AEDP therapist, and a mind-body coach. So Mary Claire works with people with chronic pain, chronic dizziness, and many other chronic medically unexplained conditions and symptoms to help them recover. Mary Claire has many different strengths, but one of her great areas of interest is trauma. And so today we're taking a deep dive into trauma, what it is, why you should care about it if you have a chronic medically unexplained condition, even if you don't think of yourself as having had traumatic experiences or a difficult childhood. And we talk about what it means to process traumas, to process and feel emotions. And we give you some very concrete ways to start working through this on yourself, as well as providing you with some recommendations for how to get further help if you feel that you need it. I think you're going to learn a lot from this interview, so please enjoy. And as always, please like, share, and subscribe to my channel or podcast if you like my content. It helps me bring it to more people. Please enjoy this interview. All right, Mary Claire, welcome. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk to me today. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm super excited because we have some very interesting topics to discuss, to break down today. Um, but before we start talking about trauma and before we start talking about mind body stuff can you tell us a little bit about how you first became interested in mind body disorders yes so um i first became interested in mind body disorders professionally um so i was at a training for intensive short-term dynamic psychotherapy I think in 2015. And I think that was the first time I ever heard about a psychological treatment being used to treat physical symptoms. And I was so amazed and intrigued. And something about it felt really right to me. Um, and I think maybe a year later, around that, I started working at the Pain Psychology Center in LA. I was there for a few years. Um, and, and I realized what felt kind of right about it to me was that when I was in the training, I thought about my own history and realized that I had had quite a few mind-body symptoms of my own. Um, and so there was kind of like a, a light bulb moment that went off. That's a um, trend I see very frequently. I, yes. I have yet to meet a practitioner who says, yeah, I just, just totally academic. You know, it was just yeah. really interesting. I've never suffered from one myself. I don't know. Just uh, <gasps> appeal to me. It's, yeah. we've, all, we've all had them. I think it's just like it's part of the human condition, right? To have mind body disorders. Yeah, it is. Um, it is. Yeah. And so for me, I had a symptom. I've yet to meet another person who has had this. I had psychogenic fevers. Um, wow. Yes. So for a period of about a year, I had fevers on and off. Um, and I felt hot all the time, though. Um, and so obviously, fevers usually mean you have an infection. So I went to the doctor. And I kept going to the doctor and we kept investigating. Everything was coming back normal. Um, and eventually my doctor stopped letting me come in. When my fever was below a certain point, she was like, I don't know. I can't, there's nothing I can do for you. Eventually she was like, this must just be stress related. And so I, I started therapy. Um, eventually it started to decrease, but I was incredibly fixated on it. I was taking my temperature like a billion times a day. Uh, I was constantly monitoring it, constantly aware of it. Um, and so it, you know, it took a while, but eventually it did. It did. Go wow. Away. Yeah. And actually, I, you are not alone because yes. I have seen people with long COVID syndrome mm. have psychogenic fevers. Okay. So I, I think there are others out here, maybe even among my audience who have experienced that too. Great. I'm in good company. You're yeah. in great company. Yes. Yeah. Miserable, but great company. Yes. Yeah. 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 It was yes. awful. Yeah. So by that point, did you already know about this mind body connection or was that, did that come later? That came later. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, 
I really had no idea. I just eventually stopped barking up the physical tree because I wasn't I wasn't getting anywhere. And mm -hmm. then when I got into my own therapy, um, started doing you know trauma work, emotional work. Eventually, that it started to just kind of naturally decrease. Okay. Um, so it it really solidified for me the need to to do that emotional work um, to turn down the the emotional danger signals that are uh, sometimes at play. And that is an amazing seg into kind of our big topic for today, right? So you at, at a Better Mind Center, mm -hmm. I'm sure one of the first line treatments that you use or a first line approach, I suppose, for people with chronic pain, chronic dizziness, chronic fatigue syndrome, yeah. IBS, is going to be something like pain reprocessing therapy, where we're explaining to people, where we're teaching them, where there's a, a, a focus on helping people understand and changing their reactions to symptoms. Mm -hmm. But what you just mentioned is that for some people, that is not enough. And I was wondering if before we talk about who that is and what we do about it, you could explain why that might be. Like, why would someone's emotional history potentially lead to chronic symptoms? It's a big question, and mm -hmm. I'm sure different people would answer it differently, but I'll, I'll tell mm -hmm. you what, uh, how I understand it. So our early experiences are encoded and remembered in our nervous systems, right? Early attachment trauma is, is encoded in the nervous system. Um, those early experiences teach us about ourselves, what we can expect from other people uh, and how we relate to our own emotions. So, and what I mean by what we can expect from other people is, are you gonna hurt me? Are you gonna criticize me, right? What can I expect when I connect to you, mm -hmm. right? And then were our emotional needs met? Um, whenever I expressed a feeling, um, did my caregiver get overwhelmed um, or get angry with me, right? This will teach me feelings are not safe, um, and emotions will be experienced as anxiety provoking. Um, and you know, that anxiety can turn on the fight or flight response, um, which you know, can turn on symptoms. Mm. Um, and so we, we basically build these emotional maps. They're sometimes called internal working models, but they're, they're stored in our limbic system. And we move through the world with this emotional map. Um, and this emotional map can Tell us if we are generally safe or generally unsafe in the world. Mm. So already raising a question for me then. Obviously, we're going to talk about potential traumatic experiences having caused some of these issues. But what, what you described, you said early attachment traumas. Mm -hmm. And it also sounds like you're implying that it's, it's, it's not necessarily things that people would identify as traumatic, mm -hmm. as being early attachment traumas or early attachment wounds. Is that right? Yes. Um, so I think of trauma really broadly, anything that disrupts your relationship with safety mm -hmm. in some way, right? And so that can be things that happened or that can be things that didn't happen but should have happened, right? So that can be, you know, being yelled at, right? Being verbally abused, being emotionally abused, physically abused, but it could be being neglected. Um, it could be, you know, again, like caregiver gets overwhelmed whenever mm -hmm. you have an emotion that's not, they're not necessarily doing that on purpose, um, but they're not meeting your need, right? And that can be experienced as traumatic and that shapes the way we experience ourselves and we experience the world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think you, you made that crystal clear, but just to kind of reiterate and condense for anyone who needs a little bit of a reminder. What you're saying is that early danger signals are encoded in your in your nervous system. Mm -hmm. And then later on down the road, you're more likely to make a judgment of things being dangerous, even when someone else who didn't have that experience might not respond to them that way, respond to those experiences that way. Yes. So for example, two people could have a bout of vestibular neuritis and have a virus attack the inner ear. Mm -hmm. And someone who had really good attachments, a really smooth childhood, 
their body may not be primed to respond with as much alarm as yes. someone who has exactly the same illness, the same symptoms, but who had some of those early experiences. Yes. And there's two things coming to mind as, as you say that. And I, it's a little bit of a tangent, but I, I wonder. I love tangents. Go bit. for okay, it. Great. So <clears throat> the impact on, on trauma and symptoms is, is really profound, right? Um, uh, I think I read a statistic. It was something like 80% of people with PTSD have somatic symptoms. Mm. So huge. Um, and, and there's two pieces of the way that um, trauma and symptoms are related that I feel like are really important. So one is the alarm system and one is the interpretation system. Mm. So by, by alarm system, I mean the threat response, right? You know, when, when our brain sends a threat, the amygdala activates the, the autonomic nervous system, turns on the fight or flight response, and that gets us ready to respond to the threat. And when someone has experienced trauma, the amygdala becomes more active, more responsive, more likely to misinterpret neutral information as dangerous, right? So the, the fight or flight response can be activated much more often, right? So just as you were saying, absolutely, um, that, that physical threat can be experienced even more threatening by someone who has experienced trauma. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yes. So really someone could be at a double disadvantage then yes. having had some of these early difficult experiences. And just to be clear, again, we're not necessarily talking about situations that think of, people necessarily think of as adversity. They can be the lack of something rather than something happening. Yes. The yeah. lack of something can be just as damaging, right? Yeah. Feeling alone is one of the scariest experiences that someone can have. Right. Yeah. Feeling alone with overwhelming feelings, especially um, as a child, when you yes. are really dependent on your caregivers for safety. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is life or death. Right. When it you're is. when you're a kid. Right. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So. We I think we laid that whole framework out beautifully. And now one of the big questions that's coming to mind. People who are watching this or listening to this as a podcast they are experiencing these awful chronic dizziness symptoms. Mm -hmm. And some of them have just started. Some of them have been doing this for a while. But one question that comes up, how do, how do we know how much emotional work I'm supposed to be doing? How, how do I know that it's not just my fear and my reaction to the symptoms that's causing all this? Like, How do we differentiate between people who really need to do some of the digging on some of these emotional issues and someone who's just reacting to the symptoms in a certain way, and that's what's leading to the symptoms persisting. It's such a tricky question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I guess I would say I always look at it as a two prong approach, right? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'm going to be a dork and show you a diagram that I oh, show to all please, of my clients. Please, please. <laughs> because, you know, and I, I, I feel oh. like for, there we go. There for, we go. For everybody, this is going on, right? We've got symptom fear, and we have mm -hmm. to look at, what are the things that are feeding fear, right? How am I responding to it? What are the avoidance behaviors? You know, well, you know, am I reappraising safety? Um, but also for everybody, there there are these things that feed into the fear, right? Trauma, Trauma emotions, emotions, stress, stress, yeah. the way we relate to ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things can keep us in a state of high alert, right? For example, the, the personality traits that are frequently associated with mind-body disorders, mm -hmm. often they're survival strategies, right? They're, they are ways to survive, you know, in a difficult situation, right? Being a people pleaser, you know, can often result from having to be really vigilant of parent, right? I need mm -hmm. to constantly be monitoring how they're doing. I need to prioritize their internal state above mine so I don't set them off, mm -hmm. um, right? So often um, those survival strategies persist into adulthood and, and can inadvertently keep the system in a state of high alert, right? So sometimes looking at some of those pieces can be really important mm -hmm. um, to see how they, they might be impacting the alarm system. Mm -hmm. Okay. I completely agree with you. And I take that same approach. It's just not everyone, in, even those who are 
very much aware of mind-body syndrome, who are using pain reprocessing therapy, not everyone digs into the emotional stuff. I, I see people who are, for example, CBT trained therapists who are using PRT. But to me, like as, as you're saying, emotions are always contributing in some way. And it, it makes sense to address as many things as possible so that we can help people get better as Absolutely. effectively as possible. Yes. I mean, and, and I think that that really speaks to, um, you know, mind-body symptoms are an interpretation made by the brain based on context, right? Context is what it, the brain helps determine whether to turn on a symptom or not, mm -hmm. right? Um, and trauma, emotions, memory, all of that is part of the context. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think at least giving a glance at the context can be really helpful it's because really you know when someone has experienced trauma danger is always kind of turned to on and mm -hmm. and that can absolutely impact the that interpretation system um, that the brain uses to to turn on symptoms and, and you're speaking to something else that's really important if we're not addressing kind of that that context as you're saying we can get rid of one symptom only to be on a symptom carousel and just pick up another one a few years down the road. So if we're, we're really going to resolve that revolving door situation, we've got to, we've got to really work on the context. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think we see that time and time again. We do. Um, yes, we do. And this is why I've made a little bit of a stance about neuroplasticity training. Mm. Um, you know, again, it's very valuable to work on retraining your brain to not interpret symptoms as dangerous. But why is your brain interpreting symptoms as dangerous? Yes. Why? And, and, and with complete respect and compassion and love and empathy to everyone going through dizziness, because it's absolutely terrifying. It is terrifying. But I, I spent 10 years as an audiologist before I started working with people with chronic dizziness symptoms, and not everyone responds with that level of terror and alarm to these symptoms. And not everyone ends up going on to develop these very long-term symptoms that are medically unexplained. So the context really is, is, is to me, what we really should be asking questions about. Yes. That's such a good point. Yeah. I, it's such a big part. Yeah. Okay. Well, that is why we're having this conversation. You and I are so on the same page. That. <gasps> yes. So, so now we're going to get into the details. So people say they're watching this. They're like, okay, we're sold. We understand. I need to address my attachment wounds and trauma. Where do people even start with this? What, what does that even mean? What does it mean to address or process things? <laughs> yes. Okay. So, so much of it comes back to, to those emotional maps that we were talking about, right? Um, and I think, I'm going to show you another diagram. Um, and the reason I use so much psychoeducation is because I think often those early experiences cause us to like disattune from ourselves, right? To cut off, right? Because if, if it's kind of reflected to us that what's happening inside isn't that important, we're gonna relate to ourselves that way. Or mm -hmm. if what's happening inside is so terrifying, we're not gonna wanna look at it, right? right. right, right, um, right. And so, you know, a, a big part of starting to process trauma is just to start to like dip into the body, start to attune to what's happening inside. Um, and and to start to develop some awareness of okay what what are my patterns what's what's happening, um, and I'll actually I'll get to the diagram in a second. Um, I'm super excited so, about the diagram. I just want you to know I, <laughs> I did not make up this diagram. Though. <laughs> um, and so so those those internal maps right that we were talking about how do I relate to myself how do I relate to other people how do I relate to my emotions are stored and encoded in our nervous systems and in day to day life when that comes up. You know, we we get angry at somebody. We're have, in a situation where maybe there's more intimacy than we're close with, right? That's going to bring up a feeling, um, and that feeling is going to generate anxiety, which can then, you know, 
be part of that context that turns on symptoms. Um, and so really we want to start to interrupt that process. Um, and I'll show you, I'll show you the diagram. Okay. So this, and before, I, yes. before you do that, I just yes. want to clarify when you say anxiety, does that mean that someone perceives anxiety? No, it Thank can you. be <laughs> unconscious anxiety. And usually okay. it is unconscious anxiety, right? Okay. The amygdala is scanning for danger outside of our awareness, externally and internally. We do not have to, it's not a conscious choice and it's not a conscious experience, right? So and by so the we, time someone gets yeah. to worried thoughts, that, Sorry that doesn't, it's already happened. The, the anxiety has been there and it, who knows, it's, it's been festering in there probably for a while. Yes. And that's, okay. you know, when we were talking about earlier, how the amygdala becomes more responsive, it also makes the frontal parts of our brain less responsive. It's, it's slower in general for everybody, the alarm system, the amygdala perceives threats much faster. And then our frontal lobes come in and check out, is there actually danger here? Right. Mm -hmm. There's the really frequently used example about like snake garden hose, right? We see something in the grass over there. Our amygdala is like, there's a snake, right? And we, we go into fight or flight. We check it out. Actually, it's a garden hose, right? That part of our brain is, is much slower. Um, and so, yes, so that amygdala is scanning for threats internally, feels the beginning of an emotion, experiences as threatening, and then, you know, usually sends in a defense to wipe away that feeling, right? Mm -hmm. Or a protector, right? How, however we want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so this is called the, the triangle of um, experience or the triangle of conflict. So again, there's a feeling that comes up. It's mm -hmm. interpreted as threatening. Mm -hmm. That creates anxiety, which creates a symptom. Um, and then a defense comes in, right? Mm -hmm. and, and defense is an adaptive response given someone's experience, right? In childhood, it is threatening to the relationship to have that feeling, right? If the caregiver can't receive it. Um, and so to just send it away is the best thing that the brain could have decided to do. Mm -hmm. um, but in adulthood, that can create a lot of problems, right? Um, it, it can lead to that, that high alert state and it completely disconnects us from ourself, from our core self, um, and from our needs, from our needs. Yeah. From the good information yeah. that our feelings are telling us about. Right, um, right, right, right. Emotions are our GPS, right? They tell us where we want to go, what we want more of, what we want less of. And we, when we don't have access to that good information, we, we can't take care of ourselves, um, the way we mm. might need. Yeah. Okay. So some examples are just popping into my mind. Yeah. So of, of defenses or protective mechanisms, or I, I'll often call them, you know, processes, just, you know, the, you developed these processes to prevent something or avoidances. Mm -hmm. um, being super analytical yes. could be one, right? Like yes. trying to rationalize everything. That's such a common one, right? Because right? I feel lot. like our clients are so smart, They're so right? Smart. And yeah, so, really you are. know, go, let me figure this out. Let me go to my head. Mm -hmm. It's such a common one. Mm -hmm. um, and it can feel really helpful, right? I'm helping myself understand it, right. but it's also a way of creating distance from right. the experience. Right, right, yeah. right. I see that. I see that a lot. And of course, you know, I had Christy on here. We talked yeah. about people pleasing and perfectionism and how those can also kind of distance ourselves. That can be a, a defense, a way of coping with the feeling rather than being with the feeling itself. Yes. Um, any other big examples that come to your mind that we see frequently? I think even like looking away, right? Mm -hmm. Like when, when we're, you know, it's a way to, oh, let me just diffuse some of the emotion that's coming up, mm -hmm. talking really quickly, right? If we just keep talking, then we stay outside of our experience. Good. Yes. Um, or just dismissing oneself. Well, that's stupid anyway. So who cares? Right. Um, Great examples. Yeah. 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 Anything that gets us away from our feeling can be mm -hmm. a defense. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying that the first step here really is to become more aware of what you're not willing to or able to feel. Is that yes. is that what you're saying? Yeah. And and it can be really slow, right? Because it can be scary what's going on inside. It can feel really uncomfortable, overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And so just kind of slowly starting to tap into what's happening in my body right now. Okay. Talking about this, right? Um, 
So you're making an amazing point. I'm so happy you said that because I think there's a misconception. Like when people do buy in, they they heard the first part of our conversation. They've heard me yapping at them for a while. And they're like, I need to resolve my traumas. Yes. And they're like, okay, I'm going to make a big long list of all my traumas. And then I'm going mm -hmm. to, I don't know what to do with them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know what to do with them. Yes. It can be completely overwhelming. And sen sometimes even, even helpful tools like journaling can cause people to become even more cerebral or become more in their heads about the things <gasps> yes. that have happened to them. So what you're saying is a good tool to start with is to just start practicing being in your body right now and noticing what's happening right now. Right now. Just in little bites, right? Because sometimes staying for too long feels like too much, but yeah. just hanging out for 30 seconds. What's happening right now as I'm sitting here, right? Is, is yeah. a perfect place to start. Yeah. Um, so tough. And it is so tough. It, yeah. That can be that can be really hard. Yeah, um, but it's it's the place that I start with clients. Mm -hmm. I, it's it's a great place to start. How do they how do they do that when they feel so uncomfortable physically? Like, how, do you have any any tips on how to how to start really just going inside and noticing what's happening when you are just so miserable and uncomfortable? Um. Well, one is, yeah, doing it in really small verse. Mm -hmm. um, and the other can even be starting to pay attention to something nice, right? So it could be like, you know, paying attention to what does it feel like when I rub my hands together? Or what does it feel like when I pet my dog? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it, it doesn't have to be, let me go to where the discomfort is. It can mm -hmm. be, you know, let me, let me just practice coming inside my body and in a nice, easy way, um, mm -hmm. using the breath as a tool um, to to help start to downregulate the nervous system. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, tough. But but what you're talking about here is a little different from mm -hmm. mindfulness, and it's a little different from somatic tracking. And I'm I want to make this clear to people because they're going to be like, okay, well, I already do the breath thing. What you're talking about is is I don't know how else to say this. Hopefully you'll have a better way to say this, but starting to befriend and really intentionally go inside your body and experience it rather than I'm practicing focusing on my breath rather than I'm practicing responding to my symptoms separately, like in a different way. You got this it. is really a process of befriending your body. That is the exact word that I oh, would use. Fantastic. Okay. Befriend is it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's like, it's okay that this is, it's okay that this feels so uncomfortable inside right now. Can I just practice being with it? Can I practice offering a little tenderness to it? Right. Mm -hmm. And that can be really hard to do too. That might be a, Definitely. we're way down the line. Right. Um, but yeah, start starting to befriend, starting to feel like this, this is okay. I can come inside and be with us. Okay. So yeah. first getting some context, understanding why. Second, starting to work on being inside our bodies in, in some way. And there are many practices, of course, I'm sure people have, have used to do that, but certain types of intentional movement in yoga could also be used that way, right? It's not just, I have to sit here and do this. It could also be through movement. I think movement is a wonderful way to mm -hmm. start to tap into the body, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think we also then get this the sense that things shift Quickly, right? Like things might feel different when we're doing one pose versus another pose, right? And mm -hmm. just kind of watching what happens inside. Yeah. Okay. So I I'm hearing, I'm hearing my audience talking to me now and they're saying, okay, cool, but then what? <laughs> like, so now I'm starting to befriend my body. What does this have to do with my past experiences? Like, how do I get there? How do I get to my past experiences? This is a great question. Um so it all really comes back to those, those emotional maps again, mm -hmm. right? That we want to access those emotional maps mm -hmm. in the present moment, right? And one way of doing that is through something called a portrayal. Um, and a portrayal is using the imagination to have an experience in the present moment. And through the imagination, we might go to, um, an avoided person, situation, emotion, to try to have a new experience with it. Mm. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. um, so, so you wouldn't necessarily pick the worst thing that's ever happened to you. We could start really small, right? Like yes. I know when I, um, do this particular thing, it makes me feel very tense and very activated. We might start with something simple, like having a conversation with a neighbor that I don't like, right? It could be that's something very simple. Perfect example. Yeah. Yeah. And just noticing what what happens inside as I imagine talking to them. And I want to be clear, portrayals are sometimes a rehearsal for real life, but sometimes, sometimes they they're are. not. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, Good point. And really what they are about is having a new experience on the inside, right? Starting to change that emotional map in, mm -hmm. in some kind of way. So so it might be a rehearsal for real life, right? Let me, you know, let me imagine my neighbor here with me, right? Mm -hmm. You know, can I imagine looking at them? Can I imagine, you know, okay, how do I feel towards them about what they did, right? Mm -hmm. What's happening in my body right now? What does this feel like? Um, and what does this feeling make me want to say? What does this feeling make me want to do, right? Um, and it could be for something pleasant too, right? It could be, mm -hmm. I really want to get close to my neighbor and I'm terrified of that, right? right? Um, and um, so feelings have, have three components that we, we want to try to access to help someone fully experience an emotion. So there's the cognitive label, right? I feel happy feelings towards my neighbor. Mm -hmm. There's a physical pathway in the body. I feel warm and I feel, you know, you know, good inside. And then there's an impulse. It makes me want to kind of reach out and, you know, touch their hand. So we might imagine, okay, what would you want to say to the neighbor? How would you want to express this to them? What would you want to do, right? And if closeness and intimacy is terrifying to this person, this, this might be really scary, it might be hard, um, but they have an experience of, of doing it, right? In a new way. And there's research that demonstrates imagining things uses almost all the same parts of our brain as actually yes. doing it, yeah. right? Um, and so that can be a new corrective emotional experience that changes that internal map, changes that relationship with the emotion, even though nothing has actually happened externally. Mm -hmm. um, and often it does lead to change, you know, out, outside of the, the portrayal, but that experience in itself can be incredibly transformative. Oh my gosh. I have so much to to unpack from what you just said. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out which direction to go in first. Yeah. So I love that you just gave us such an actionable piece of, of activity to do. Yeah. So someone could start small, even if they're not really sure how their relationship with a spouse or neighbor or child relates to traumatic or difficult past experiences. They could start with something that now makes them feel not so good. And as an aside, I wanted to ask, do you suggest focusing on things related to the symptoms or not related to the symptoms? Well, I guess it could be either or both, right? Mm -hmm. Because obviously sometimes we recognize, oh yeah, whenever my partner does blah, 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 I have mm -hmm. a huge flare the next day. Probably, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we need to look at that eventually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but other things that don't seem exactly directly related, but we know we experience stress about or we avoid are, are also fair game, right? Or are part of right. this process. And I'd, I'd love to hear your feedback on this. Yeah. One thing that I advise people though, is when they find anger or some other strong emotion coming up about symptoms themselves, mm -hmm. like symptoms oh, themselves. Yes. Yeah. I, no, <laughs> I, right. So please, please. Yeah clarify further, if you could, why we might not want someone to focus on on visualizing or or having a portrayal related to, like directly related to symptoms? Well, the symptoms aren't trying to hurt you, right? They, they are not the source here, right? Um, and so I guess, I guess it's twofold. So one is that really encourages an adversarial relationship with the symptoms, which, you know, ups danger mode. It ups the danger. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and then that also kind of displaces the feelings in a way, right? Mm -hmm. um, we want the feel 
the feelings to go towards a person, um, mm -hmm. right? And so directing them towards the symptoms isn't necessarily going to be productive. It's kind of just going to keep us stuck in a loop. That's and it's totally. it's going to, as you said, up the danger in a way that's that's not going to be helpful or productive. Um, and it's also mm -hmm. opposite of that kind of befriend what's going on inside mission that's that's absolutely a part of the work as well. Yes. And I, I'm gonna I'm gonna reiterate something we were just talking about earlier to also help clarify this that we've already made the case in our conversation that the real source of the danger mode that's leading to the symptoms is these interrelational um, problems, these, these this danger mode situation that's arisen from, from traumatic or very difficult earlier experiences. And so that's, that's the danger mode source we're trying to turn off, not necessarily the more superficial response to the symptoms. So- that's it. If I may ask, so when someone shows up in an appointment and is like raging about the symptoms, yeah. okay, like, I can't believe this happened to me. Like, this is just so unfair. This is horrible. Like, I can't, you know, and is like super mad about symptoms or full of fire about the symptoms. How do you, how do you direct that person to work with that in a, in a helpful way? Yes. Um, so usually to me that that means some protective part has mm -hmm. gotten activated, mm -hmm. right? It feels yeah. like something's not going right in this process. Um, and sometimes there's, you know, frustration with themselves, you know, some perfectionism, um, you know, feeling hopeless about the process. So usually something old is showing up with us. And so usually I, I like to just make a lot of space for it if we can, um, mm -hmm. right? Not necessarily ag agree with, with what it's saying, but make, make a lot of space for mm -hmm. what, what is coming up right now? What does this feel like inside? Um, you know, what, what's happening right now is you mm -hmm. tell me about um, this part of you that is just so frustrated yeah. with this process. So I feel like that that's usually where I start is just making a lot of space so we can better understand what this is about. Because mm -hmm. usually, I mean, it, this is such a frustrating, difficult, non-linear mm -hmm. process. And I think people get really, really scared they when- should. Yeah, they should. You know, you yeah. know, oh, this was going so well last week and I took a turn, what's going on, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so a lot of fear gets activated. And so we, we can just make space for that first. Yes. So. Yeah. But there's a difference between making space for that fear and the anger and all these other things that are coming up and thinking that that's the road we need to go down in order to get better. So I guess what I'm, let me back up for a second. One thing that I really have a soapbox about is people saying to think positive mm. uh, because many of the difficulties people with chronic dizziness are having because they weren't feeling their emotions in the first place. So like the last thing I want to tell them to do is bypass when they're feeling really upset. Oh, yes. So there's a balance between holding space for the anger, the frustration, the hopelessness, the despair, but also realizing that the intensity of those feelings is often related to other stuff that really has nothing to do with the symptoms, which is something that you, you started talking about a few moments ago, that old stuff is coming up, you're saying, right? Yeah. Yeah. Usually a lot a lot of old stuff is is coming up and so when we when we start to make space for you know what what is this feeling saying mm -hmm. you know uh where does this feeling sit in the body um you know sometimes we even try to age it right like mm -hmm. how old is this part of you yeah. um right sometimes we get a sense of what what is this old feeling that is coming up now um and you know, it could be kind of an, an old helpless feeling, right, mm -hmm. from uh, when they were much younger. And when, you know, when we were talking about portrayals earlier, they can happen between people, but they also can happen internally, right? So maybe we need to let this this younger part share what's coming up for them, right? right. What, what is this like? What feels so scary here? And really... Um, 
witness and, and hear what, what they need to say. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm hearing then is the, the anger in, in some of these cases, especially when it's about symptoms, it's, it's a reaction to some other emotion that's probably getting stirred up. Yes. And if we allow space for the anger, then we might be able to get to the, the, the real feeling or the, the triggering feeling, the, the, the scarier feeling underneath. And often that might lead us to some of these earlier feelings, these earlier situations. Yes, absolutely. Amazing. Okay. That was a really long aside that I took us on. <laughs> I always thought it was really important to clarify because people are going to be like, ooh, cool. I'm going to practice feeling really angry about my symptoms. And that's not what we're saying. No. Right. Yes. Thank right. you for clarifying right. that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So going back to the portrayal. So mm -hmm. what you're suggesting is picking situations right now relationships right now as as kind of a pathway as a trailhead to help lead us because ultimately when big feelings come up they're going to lead us back to this map that you were talking about and the map is was was mapped out in earlier times and early maybe in early childhood or maybe a little bit later and so by doing that naturally we're going to reach those maps yes absolutely yeah because you know again this this, this is going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, I'm feeling angry. That mm -hmm. feels scary, right? I'm noticing I'm, I'm blocking it, right? I'm, you right. know, distracting from it. Um, and, you know, can I let it be here, right? Can I try to sit with it inside mm -hmm. just a little bit longer um, so I can show my system that this is actually safe, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think absolutely starting in the here and now um, is, is really helpful and, and sometimes eventually going back right. to those, those bigger events can be incredibly helpful and transformative. Um, and, you know, I want to put the, the caveat here. There's a lot of wonderful books that I think can help people start to um, learn about what's happening inside, do some of this work themselves. Sometimes it might, you might realize this is really big. I might need someone to help me with this. And so I think mm -hmm. a therapist can be helpful or just a, a trusted other, right? Mm -hmm. But not doing it alone, I think, um, can be really helpful. What books do you recommend? Um, there's a book I really love called It's Not Always Depression by mm -hmm. Hilary Jacobs Hendel. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, there's Howard Schubiner's workbook, Unlearn Your Pain, mm -hmm. and it gives you a, a good walkthrough. Mm -hmm. um, what mm -hmm. this might look like. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's just, I'm just remarking in my head on how different this is from a cognitive behavioral approach. Like it's just, it's the, op it's like literally the opposite direction. You're with a cognitive approach. And again, many people who watch my channel have taken my advice and been to see a therapist and often it's talk therapy, which is mm -hmm. wonderful and beneficial in many ways. But if we're just looking at at the processes and we're just trying to change those processes or defenses or parts like protectors, yeah. it can absolutely have an effect on someone, but we're not really getting at the root of what caused it to be the way that it is. And yes. I think that makes change more difficult. Absolutely. Um, so a couple things are coming up. Um, so yes, I think a lot of therapies, cognitive therapies included are about kind of like decreasing affect, right? Yes. Like yes. regulate emotion, push emotion down. Yes. Um, yes. And there's actually been some research that demonstrates the more affect there is in therapy, the, the better the results, right? So emotions can be incredibly transformative um, because they give us an experience, right? We've, we've been talking about how those maps are built through experience. Our brains are incredibly plastic and they learn through experience, right? Experience is the most effective way to, to change the brain um, in, a, in a meaningful way. Yes, yes. which is why I've, I've spoken at length about ex using or trying to find someone who uses an experiential kind of therapy rather than a cognitive-based therapy. Yes, yes. Absolutely. And I know that's, again, very validating to hear from me, but also I think very helpful for people to hear from you that that's going to be the most effective way to change those emotional maps. 
absolutely. And you know, when we think about it, trauma is not just a story, right? It's it's encoded in the body. There's many senses involved, right? So we can talk about something, mm -hmm. stay in the story, but that that doesn't activate, you know, the neural networks, the parts of our body that are involved in, um, in trauma, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So I guess what we're getting to now is We've talked about a lot of things that people can do on their own, starting small, starting to work with portrayals mm -hmm. that are in the here and now that feel, I guess, more accessible. At what point should someone say, you know, I feel like I need professional guidance with this. At what point does that happen? Yeah. Well, first I want to say, um, we are all so much more resilient than we think we are, right? And can tolerate so much more than we think we can. But if you are noticing, I feel really scared to do this by myself. There are places that I don't wanna go by myself. I'm trying to think about this and I'm just getting so overwhelmed. Um, I think having someone else um, to help you go slow, to regulate, to look for things, um, mm -hmm because we all, we all have blind spots. Defenses are unconscious usually, right? We don't know that we're employing them. Yeah. So having someone else kind of notice, oh, I'm seeing this or I'm, I'm noticing this can help you then start to notice what's happening inside. And so, yeah, I guess I would say if, if you're feeling really scared, if you feel really mm -hmm. overwhelmed, mm -hmm. um, it might be helpful to have, have someone else. And a yeah. lot of healing can happen in the relationship too, right? Because so much of those, those maps are about other people mm -hmm. um, and what we're expecting from other people. And, and so I think having the experience in the context of a relationship can also be totally really powerful. Yeah. And then maybe also, would you say people who have kind of the opposite problem, they just feel so disconnected and dissociated from it. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah everything was fine in my childhood and everything's fine now. <laughs> I hear that sometimes. <gasps> yeah. Or, or sometimes aware. that's true, right? Yeah. <laughs> Usually yeah. no. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right, right. So for those folks too, and then as you and I just mentioned, it may be more especially helpful for those of you who are big analytical minds who yes. can narrate your way through all sorts of stories you want to go to someone who's not going to just talk to you because yes. we're just i've i've said to people jokingly before or not so jokingly that in my experience in my own personal therapy the only part of me that got therapy for the longest time was my narrator like that part of me got wow. great therapy she yes. did awesome she was doing fantastic but the parts of me that actually needed the therapy they didn't show up in the in the narrative so they didn't show up in the therapist's office at all so i could talk about all these things and it was this mature part of me doing all yes. the talking yes but then yeah the the parts that need attention mm -hmm. get missed yes i i uh, some researchers think that part of the link between chronic symptoms and trauma is that avoidance is a primary strategy in both mm. right we avoid experiences that are associated with symptoms and we avoid emotions that are associated with you know with pain and so if we just talk we are avoiding right we're mm -hmm. colluding with the defenses in a way right so so coming inside as hard and scary as that is um, is really where where the change can occur brilliant point yeah. brilliant point so just again just restating that because i think it's so important just by just talking about some of your bad experiences can sometimes be used as a form of avoidance. Yes. And this is, again, why, again, journaling is an incredible tool for kind of opening your awareness a little bit. Oh, actually, maybe things weren't so great, you know, 10 years ago. But it doesn't necessarily help you process emotions. And it sounds like what you're saying, and please help me flesh out this definition if if i'm missing something what you're saying is what it means to process emotions and past experiences is changing the emotion map 
with a new affect. So in other words, changing the emotional burden of a particular experience, the emotional uh, dimension of a particular experience, and changing the way that we respond automatically to a particular emotion. Is that, am I in the ballpark there? Yes. Um, yes. And that can only happen through experience, right? We can talk about, oh, I know anger is actually okay to feel, mm -hmm. but we have to actually feel it yes, for it to start to feel okay, right? For the system to learn, I don't need to protect myself that way anymore, right? Because mm -hmm. that only happened because it was protective and adaptive, right? We yeah. only use defenses because they were protective and adaptive. Mm -hmm. And we can cognitively know, I don't need to do that anymore, but that's mm -hmm. not how the system learns, right? The, the emotional system is nonverbal. So it has to learn by actually feeling. I am feeling anger in my body and it is safe. I am feeling this and it's okay. Um, and, you know, I'll give one more kind of general, I have so many clients who have a really hard time experiencing anger towards someone who hurt them, right? Yeah. Usually in childhood. And that could be because, you know, it's their parent. There's a lot of complex mixed feelings. Their parent was really ill um, mm. or mentally ill, right? And so it, it feels like I'm, I'm not allowed to feel this feeling. And that can lead to a lot of feelings being directed inside, a lot of shame, a sense that there's something wrong with me. And so getting to experience the feeling towards the person it belongs to, having a new experience inside of feeling yourself differently, letting go of, as you were saying, those emotional burdens, feeling safe, feeling this feeling, um, can be incredibly transformative, mm. right? Can change that internal map in such a, an important way. Um, and it, there's a Gabor Mate quote, it's trauma isn't what happened to you, it's what happened inside of you. Yes. Right? Amen. And so we yes. want to like, you know, we can't change what happened, but we can change the experience of it, right? Yes. Have a voice when you didn't get to have a voice, say the things that you needed to say. Um, and that really can change that that internal experience, that internal map. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And, and what you're saying is, First of all, obviously, this is most easily done with another person. This is most easily done with a with a supportive therapist or or some other supportive person yes. um, who can who can hold space and provide the corrective experience because here you are experiencing this emotion this way, and that person is instead of reacting in in a negative way or in the way that maybe happened back then, that person's holding space and allowing it to be. So that that can be corrective. Yes. But what you're also saying is people have some power to do this themselves too. Yeah. And it's not a matter of regulating your emotions away. It's the opposite. It's yeah. it's not, oh no, I'm feeling anger. So better start breathing here and bring the anger back down. It's no. it's it's finding a way to to build your tolerance in a way That's for it. your own emotions and being able to to I guess hold compassionate space. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm, I'm using a very abstract term, but hold compassionate space for yourself while you're experiencing something that in the past was, was not acceptable to feel. Absolutely. Yeah. We want, we want to invite it in, right? We mm -hmm. want to hear what it has to say, mm -hmm. right? Um, what wasn't allowed before, right? We want to bear witness to that. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's, um, there's this concept of undoing aloneness. Um, mm. And um, Bezel van der Kolk says that so much of trauma is about feeling alone, unseen, unheard, unreflected, mm -hmm. right? And so treatment should be about feeling heard, reflected, and seen, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so obviously that can happen in a relationship, sure. um, but that also can happen internally right? We can see and hear and reflect and make space for, um, you know, and really invite in those feelings that deserve to be spoken. And yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was just thinking 
on a practical level, people are going to be like, okay, how do I do that? And I was just wondering what your thoughts are on using something like Kristen Neff's exercises or her workbook to, mm -hmm. to kind of from like in a top down way, start developing self-compassion mm -hmm. and then starting to do some of this work, this emotional work so that they have, they already have kind of this, this habit or this practice of holding space for themselves. Yeah. So there's like a framework to receive it. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. I like that. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. 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 I know it may look very different with a therapist though. So I'm, I'm curious, could you, could you tell me what that, what this, like walk us through what this might look like with a, a pretend client? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I warned you about this question. So <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. What this could look like with a pretend client. Well, kind of would bring together all the elements that, that we've talked about, right? Mm -hmm. We would start to come inside, start to befriend, you know, what's, what's coming up? What, you know, can we prioritize your internal experience? Can we be with what's happening moment to moment, right? Um, we would start to understand that internal map a little bit, right? What What's happening for me? What are the patterns? Um, what are the emotions and situations um, and experiences that my brain perceives as dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. And defends against, right? We probably would go to that first diagram and really map out like, what what is my context? Mm -hmm. um, and then we would, you know, slowly start to approach these things together, right? And work on having a new experience, right? Mm -hmm. Experiencing the self differently, um, experiencing the relationship differently, um, you know, and and inviting in whatever comes up because it's it's all um, it's all information, right? And it's all opens up possibility for change, right? Like even, even having a new experience with me can be terrifying, right? Like people totally. can ex expect me to hurt them the way mm -hmm. their caregivers hurt them, mm -hmm. right? And so taking in someone else differently um, in the context of doing this emotional work. Um, can be part of the process too. It's mm -hmm. I don't know that I'm fully doing justice to such a, it's so hard. a it's complex such a process, right? Because yeah. as we've been talking yeah. about, it is so like right brain nonverbal, right? There's there's these things that we move through, but there's also it's it's incredibly experiential, right? It's incredibly mm -hmm. body based, and some of that is hard to describe. Yeah, but yeah. but I but that's a really that's actually something I think is worth pointing out that yeah. there's a lot of not talking in in yeah. in my sessions with people yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of dead air um and that's the i i i feel like sometimes the less talking there is the more productive sessions are sometimes because it means that that person is is spending their time feeling and i'm wondering if if you notice that as well when you're kind of deep into this this work, if, if that is also something that's a feature of some of those more, I guess, emotionally focused sessions. Yes, there is sometimes not a lot of content, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes someone's narrating for me what's what's right. happening inside, sure. right? But we're not necessarily in story. We're mm -hmm. in their bodies. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you we built that capacity maybe to stay there a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where the experience happens is, is inside. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, sometimes there's, there's not a lot of content or story. It's, um, it's really an internal experience that's being narrated. It is. Yeah. Wonderful. That, I think that, I think you did a beautiful job of explaining what this looks like. Thank you. <laughs> so if it's okay, I want to switch gears a little bit and just talk a little more generally about PTSD and and post traumatic stress symptoms. Mm -hmm. So, just want to get your take on this. So, there is a group of researchers 
looking at chronic dizziness, a specific type called PPPD, which I'm sure some of your patients have because we we share clients. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure you got some of them on your on your uh, roll call there. So um, PPPD is basically unexplained chronic dizziness, not otherwise explained by any other cause. So it's a it's a diagnosis of uh, that's symptom based, and it's basically a diagnosis of exclusion. And clearly it's a mind body symptom as far as I'm concerned, mind body syndrome. So there's a group of researchers that are looking at this and they're saying that they believe that PPPD is vestibular PTSD. So they say, oh. uh, they, they're saying that they think PPPD happens because some people who develop some kind of ear problem or vestibular problem are developing kind of a post-traumatic syndrome, and that's what's leading to the chronic symptoms. So first of all, just kind of based on what I said, what do you think of that take? Do you think that that's a, a reasonable take on that? Yeah. I mean, PTSD is basically like danger stuck in on, right? right. And right. anything can get associated with threat, right? If the brain thinks, this is how I'm going to save you, right? It's going to keep um, firing over and over and over again, mm -hmm. um, protectively. So absolutely. Uh, yes. I think that's possible. Okay. Yeah. So I completely agree with you. Yeah. What concerns me is that this group of researchers now they're, they're doing things like, um, looking at people's anxiety scores. Uh, and as we talked about before, anxiety is not always, resulting in worries. It's not always resulting in a cognitive or, or obvious anxiety in it someone. Could be unconscious. It could be unconscious and be the, and result in a whole bunch of defenses that totally cover it up, like yes. people pleasing and perfectionism and, um, you know, being a goodist and being super conscientious, yep. conscientious. So someone's anxiety isn't always going to show up on a clinical questionnaire about generalized anxiety disorder. And that's such a good point. Absolutely. Right. So, yes. so they're they're focusing on these kind of immediate clinical signs that someone may have had prior to the PPPD diagnosis, and what I think that they should be looking at are the other factors that we already know predispose someone to PTSD. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could talk about what those things are. So, if someone has uh, a, a traumatic or difficult experience, what makes that person more likely to develop post-traumatic symptoms? Um, <clears throat> so mm, a couple things are coming to mind. So mm -hmm. one is an insecure attachment. A secure attachment is one of the best inoculations we can have against developing PTSD. Yeah. Um, it, it is a protective system. So mm -hmm. if someone didn't have, um, a childhood that gave them a secure attachment that would predispose them to developing PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that's really one of the big ones. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other factors that are coming up are um, if the protective system was blocked in some way, I think, you know, research has demonstrated if people aren't able to complete, right. Like we were talking about emotions have, that that impulse right mm -hmm. like i have fear i want to run away right if people are held down right or not able to defend themselves things like that um that can kind of keep um the the danger stuck in on mm -hmm. um and if people are really left alone with their mm -hmm. um overwhelming feelings mm -hmm. um about something that happened and i think that also goes back to the mm -hmm. the attachment piece right Yes. Oh my yeah. gosh. I have so much to say about this because when you're saying this, I'm thinking about the the journey of the vestibular patient mm. and the coldness with which they are often treated by the people they're, they're looking to for help, like the physicians yeah. who uh, they are dismissed. They are subjected to gaslighting. They are uh, told, I don't know what's wrong with you. They are, have these traumatic, I mean, really traumatic experiences just trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. And as you're saying, if someone has this history of an insecure attachment and maybe is already under some stress in his or her life, that's a recipe for post-traumatic symptoms. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like, uh, 
you're being met with like a unresponsive caregiver, right? I mean, right. that's that's absolutely going to activate all of those those stored and remembered threat responses. Yes, yes, yes. and and so that's. I wonder sometimes if people were met with compassionate care mm -hmm. and just someone who was just like who put a hand on that person's shoulder and was like, "You're you're gonna be okay. We're gonna figure this out. Everything's all right." Like if they were just given that level of kind of just basic compassion at their various appointments, how many of them would go on to resolve their symptoms rather than having it become chronic? I mean, I feel moved when you bring that up. Like, absolutely. I think that would make all of the difference in the world mm -hmm. um, to, I mean, I don't know. Do you remember the the attachment research that was done on babies where they would like have the the parent respond with a a blank face. Yes. Um, right. And like the amount of distress that would happen inside. Can you uh, explain? Like, to, so for people who don't know. So there was research done um, where they um, they had a, a mother and child come into a room. And they, at first the mom was interacting with the baby, right? Oh, like they were laughing mm -hmm. together. And then suddenly they had the mom stop, right? Via mm -hmm. blank face. Mm -hmm. And the babies would be, I think it was for two minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and they were terrified and they would get so distressed and so dysregulated. And then the mother would start engaging again and it would take a while for them to come down. And I think they were studying the patterns of how does the baby respond? But just those two minutes of a blank face meeting them terrified them inside, right? And so when we're thinking about someone who had a lifetime of experiences like that, and then being met with a cold blank face that's saying, I don't know, I don't know how to help you. I don't know what's wrong with you. Take this the medicine. Fear, yeah, the yeah. fear that's generated inside is, is huge. And so absolutely being met with someone who is warm and is listening and responsive, that tells our attachment system that we can relax versus that we need to be on high alert. We need to be like, there's a threat here. Um, yeah. So absolutely. Yeah, I I know. I It's one of my, my oh. soapboxes for a reason because I, yes. I hear the horror stories all the time. What you said though also made me realize though that not to say the external environment doesn't play a huge role here, but if someone has kind of this, again, has had these insecure attachments and as a result has developed all these defenses or these coping mechanisms or way to quell anxiety, such as being really harsh on him or herself, such yes. as, you know, being the go-to person that everyone relies on, that person is so much more likely to beat him or herself up for being sick and and not be willing to ask for the help that's yeah. needed and and not be able to take in compassion and caring even when it is shown because they're not used to it. Yeah, you're bringing up something so important, like re the receptive capacity. Yes, right? yes. Can I take this in? Yeah. Is it safe to take this in? Yeah. Um, and not always, right? That That right. can take work on those maps that we were talking about, right? Yeah. Um, even if it's coming from a really genuine, safe person, right? Um, our brains are predictive and protective, right? Mm -hmm. So if they're predicting this isn't going to be safe, they will protectively not take it in. Right, yeah. right. And I see that. I had, a, I had a conversation with a client earlier this week about that. We talked about kind of this, this lens through which she's seeing the world and that even when people are offering caring and compassion, she gets she 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 gets anxious. She it makes her feel it makes her feel worse. It makes her feel suspicious. Like why you know, or she or she feels like insulted sometimes when people are trying to care for her. Yes. And to me, that's maybe the people are being insulting or 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 what have you. But chances are they're they're not. And it's it's a matter of again, it's one of those defenses gone awry and something that was protective earlier in life now making it so someone can't get what he or she needs to to regulate and feel better yes yeah the amygdala is gonna be perceiving danger everywhere right yeah. even if, even if it's not there right neutral 
neutral situations, neutral facial expressions, mm -hmm. right, can be can be misinterpreted. Yeah, even um, neutral ones. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very much so. Wow. This has been such a an instructive conversation. I think I think we covered pretty much everything, although we zigzagged around a lot. Yeah. So I'd love to know if there is anything that you'd like to speak to, anything that you've seen in your clients um, that you think would be important for people with chronic dizziness to know. Um, I think the really big thing that I want to leave people with is that this is complicated, right? And I think our conversation, you know, spoke to all the complexity of, mm -hmm. you know, the different systems involved. Um, but, or and really, these things can change, right? There is so much evidence about, you know, positive neuroplasticity. People can develop earn secure attachments, mm -hmm. right? Our systems do learn through new experiences. And so, these things can change, the system can feel safer, people can reconnect with their core selves, right? All, all of these things are, are changeable and it can take some work. It might take more than eight sessions, yes. right? Um, yes. Yes. And that's yeah. okay and that doesn't mean there's something wrong, yes. right? Um, it, it can take a little more time, but absolutely the system can come back to safety. Um, that's, that's beautiful. Okay, so what do you say to people who say, I've seen all these people in the YouTube comments or on forums or what have you who read the book or watch the video and they get better. And I've had it for 35 years. Is there hope for me? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Of course there's hope for you. Um, and yeah, like they, they might have secure attachments. They might, you know, I think 50% of people, that seems too high, but apparently that's the number. 50%? Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow, um, that's still abysmal. I know, right? <laughs> should, oh should be way more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so most of us have more work to do um, mm -hmm. than than read a book, right? And it's okay if your system needs to learn through experiences. That's normal. That's okay. And you can get those experiences mm -hmm. that help the system uh, get shaped towards safety. And in your own personal clinical experience, yes. just for the record, have you seen people with these chronic symptoms recover even after having them for a really long time? Even after decades, mm -hmm. right? And it doesn't take decades to get out of it. Yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And in your own practice, do you also see, I know, again, we share clients, so I know the answer here, but you see people with chronic dizziness among many other chronic symptoms get yes, better as well. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, what a, what a wonderful note uh, to end our conversation. <gasps> but before we do, so we, I want to just review some of the resources we mentioned and ask you to share just one more thing. Um, you had mentioned that book and the book's name was, it's not, it's not always depression. Okay. I'll put that. I'll put a link to that in the video description. Yeah. Um, I will put a link to a better mind center so people can find you. Mm -hmm. Um, I was wondering. And they can also find me yes. at uh, therapy with Mary Claire. Okay, yes. wonderful. I'll link to that as well. And if someone needs to look for a local provider, mm -hmm. what what should that person be looking for? Does that person need to specialize in mind body conditions? What's the most important qualities or trainings or what have you that the person should be looking for in a provider to help work through this specific kind of stuff, trauma yes. and attachment stuff? Um, there's a, a couple modalities I love. Um, one I really love right now is called Accelerated Experiential Dynamic Psychotherapy. Um, so if you go on the, the ADP website, they list to that. all mm -hmm. of the therapists. Um, also, there's, there's Howard Schubiner's Mm -hmm. Emotional awareness and expression therapy, mm -hmm. um, intensive short term dynamic psychotherapy. Alan Abbas has done a bunch of research mm -hmm. demonstrating the effectiveness of, of that for treating symptoms. So there's, there's a, you know, and then IFS, right? There's, there's so mm -hmm. many different experiential therapies mm -hmm. um, that can be really helpful for this. Somatic experiencing, somatic experiencing, mm -hmm. sensory motor psychotherapy, yep. EMDR, all mm -hmm. of these are experiential therapies. Okay. And yeah. would you uh, suggest that someone uh, look for someone who has a certain 
approach or a, a certain, uh, I don't know, what, what would that first conversation, like what would they want to ask the therapist when they're interviewing someone and trying that person on, seeing if it might be a fit? Um, uh, I think, well, number one is, do you feel comfy on the right. phone yes. with the person, yeah. right? Like, do you feel safe? Are you getting good vibes? Mm -hmm. um, um, but I think, yeah, asking how, how do they approach the work? Um, you know, asking specific example, uh, specific information about how they work can be mm -hmm. really helpful. Yeah. And we're looking yeah. for someone who says, I'm going to work with you and your body in, in yes. some kind of experiential way, not just yes. thinking about or talking about. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Anything else you want people to know before we go? I think that's it. Okay. Thank you so much for wow. having me. Oh my gosh. This was, this was wonderful. I'm so happy to finally have you on. I know it was a long time coming, but worth, yeah. worth the wait for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. And everyone, of course, if you have questions or comments, just drop them below and I will see you guys next time. And please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to my channel or podcast, wherever you're hearing or watching or listening to this. All right. Take care. Thanks, Mary Claire. Bye. Bye.